Hi, I'm Daniel Zengel with PRP Labs here with Don Lipscomb, and we are going to be discussing a study that used PRP injections to help patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, so this study compared how PRP could help a patient with carpal tunnel compared to the use of a night splint, which is a, mm -hmm. a common uh, sort of treatment method. Carpal tunnel could also be treated with physical therapy, medication, steroid injections. Uh, so PRP is sort of a new approach uh, to help these patients. And Don, can you tell us a bit about the study? Sure, so uh, this study consisted of 60 patients and they all had um, been diagnosed with mild to moderate carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and they were divided into two groups. So group one um, ended up receiving an ultrasound guided uh, PRP injection mm -hmm. and group two served as a control. And so uh, the control group just basically wore um, a wrist splint like for eight hours right. overnight. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's not a double blinded study or anything no, like that. It's no. a comparative study. Exactly. Uh, but they were looking at um, how these patients responded after six months. And mm -hmm. again, this is with a single PRP injection. And I assume with the night splint, this is something they've been doing for a long time. Um, and uh, they, they measured a few different parameters. They're mm -hmm. looking at a visual analog scale, the Boston Carpal Tunnel Questionnaire, as well as the um, doing some sort of imaging of the cross-sectional area of the median nerve. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the way that they actually prepared the PRP was they did a 10 milliliter blood draw, mm -hmm. um, uh, with sodium citrate, that mm -hmm. was that was the anticoagulant, mm -hmm. and then um, they centrifuged it to produce uh, to end up producing 3.5 milliliters right. of PRP. Right. And which I what was actually pretty cool about this is that they actually activated the PRP before right. injection, and they activated it with autologous thrombin. And so this is pretty um, uncommon, at least mm -hmm. from what I've seen. People will either use bovine thrombin, which we all know is, uh, can cause very adverse. Mm -hmm. uh, effects, so you don't necessarily want to use that, right. um, but they went through the trouble of actually creating this autologous thrombin as well. Right, yeah, and, and usually when I'll see autologous thrombin used in, in a, mm -hmm. a PRP study, it's, it's usually in that some kind of surgical application yeah. where they've already got like bone they can work with or some, some kind of material that they can use to, to get the thrombin from. Mm -hmm. This would have required them uh, to, I believe they took the patient's blood and, and processed it some way to yeah. isolate the thrombin. Yeah, um, and it's it's pretty it's pretty difficult too because it's such a small protein. Right. So I remember trying to go through and read some of I think it was some of the patents or something uh -huh. for some of these, and they're not they're not super specific about the exact protocol that right. they use. So right. So yeah, I mean this is something you might not see day to day in the clinic. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times if people are going to try to activate PRP instead of going through the hassle of creating an autologous thrombin, they'll just use uh, calcium citrate or um, something that's more affordable, easier to acquire, easier yeah. to apply. Well, I think part of part of their rationale too was uh, so the thrombin is really good at catalyzing the the conversion of um, fibrogen to fibrin, mm -hmm. and so basically since it was such a, um, I think it, because it was such a precise mm -hmm. thing, they wanted to make sure that it stayed where it needed to stay. Exactly. You know, and, and so that basically created that mesh. Right. You know, and um, they injected it with enough time such that it would still be liquidy enough. Right. Uh, but it would be um, it would be firm enough to stay in place. Right, and this know? is sort of the fine art of activating yes. PRP is mm -hmm. you can't inject, or it might be very difficult to inject um, PRP that's been fully activated and formed mm -hmm. that fibrin clot, also known as platelet-rich fibrin. Yeah. However, if you activate the PRP and wait just the right amount of time, when you inject it, the hope is that it'll begin to clot, stay in that area mm -hmm. rather than rapidly dispersing throughout the body. Yeah, and I mean, uh, the patients actually showed very positive results mm -hmm. uh, in all three of in all three of uh, the topics we discussed: the visual analog scale, uh, the Boston carpal tunnel syndrome questionnaire, and the cross-sectional area, which mm -hmm. is just an imaging technique of the region. Mm -hmm. um, they, after six months, they all showed marked improvement, a statistically significant improvement mm -hmm. over the control group that was just once again the split more right. eight hours a night. So right, yeah. So you got to figure. If one PRP injection can work better than nights, many nights of wearing a splint, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably gonna make a patient's life a little easier. And, and oh, if definitely. you're seeing a greater overall improvement, might as well go with the PRP, it's looking like. Yeah, and I mean, it makes sense, like, you know, because the platelets contain growth factors that actually play a role in uh, peripheral nerve regeneration, right. just like we discussed in our peripheral neuro neuropathy video a right. little bit ago. Um, and so, uh, particularly uh, TGF, which is transforming growth factors, mm -hmm. so this plays a huge role in nerve survival 
and um, and it actually gets motor neurons uh, uh, to grow in vitro in the petri dish, mm -hmm. like just this one alone. Uh -huh. So this is something that they've actually done experimentally in petri dishes. Right, with with specifically just transforming growth yeah, factor beta, not exactly. not PRP, but no, that one no. growth factor we know can affect nerve. Exactly, and then when you when you combine it with things like insulin growth factor and um, and all the other wonderful like vascular endothelial growth factors and you right. get that revascularization right. allows those peripheral nerves to grow back and you know maybe you get results like this so. absolutely yeah so yeah it looks like some promising results again a six-month follow-up pretty impressive for mm -hmm. a single injection um, thanks again Don for, for telling us about the the latest and greatest with PRP research uh, we have some more videos coming up today so stick around and we'll be back in a few minutes